Hi everyone, Dr. Hall here, and so we're going to continue down through the alimentary canal. This is the first part of lecture 31, 31A. We're going to be talking about the liver and the gallbladder. Thus far, we've talked about all the organs in the mouth that can uh, carry out mechanical digestion, as well as how salivary amylase begins chemical digestion of carbohydrates. We remind ourselves about the epiglottis that prevents food and beverages from entering the trachea. The esophagus, which is a muscular tube that just transports food from the pharynx down to the stomach, has the lower esophageal sphincter at the top of the stomach. And then uh, not at each end. The stomach has sphincters at each end. Apologies for that. And then we talked about the stomach, which is this muscular bag that has three layers, so it can churn food. It also secretes pepsin, so it's going to start the chemical digestion of proteins, acid to kill bacteria, as well as lower the pH to activate that pepsin enzyme, and will also absorb alcohol. And then the pancreas, which has both endocrine functions in its production of the hormone insulin, and it also has exocrine function in producing and secreting enzymes that digest all four classes of molecules. So we have trypsin for proteins, pancreatic amylase for carbohydrates, lipase for lipids, and nuclease for uh, nu nucleotides, nucleic acids, excuse me. So now we're gonna talk about Larry. <laughs> Larry likes to party with Pete, which you might remember, Pete had pancreatitis. Larry's just getting over a case of having had mono, which is a viral illness, and so he decided to celebrate this past weekend with a lot of drinking, with a lot of alcohol. He felt really hungover in the morning, so he took a whole bunch of acetaminophen, more than you're really supposed to take. And then later in that day, Larry gets some abdominal pain in the upper right quadrant, and he noticed that his eyes were looking a little yellow, and he feels really lousy. So this picture is somebody with some very yellow eyes. Um, hopefully Larry is not this yellow. Um, this is not Photoshop. This is what can happen. Um, so he goes to Red Cedar, right to the Mayo Hospital here, and is diagnosed with hepatitis and admitted to the hospital. And he gets to share a room with Pete. So hepatic means of the liver, and so hepatitis is inflammation of the liver. And the liver is this very large, solid, reddish-brown colored organ in the upper right abdomen. If you've ever bought chicken livers at the store and you know what that texture is like, our liver has the same exact color and texture as a chicken liver, not the cooked ones, the raw ones. And you might recall from when we talked about the circulatory system that the liver is receiving all of the blood coming from the intestines goes in through the hepatic portal vein into the liver for processing. And then after it's been processed, then that blood can move through the hepatic veins and into the inferior vena cava. So what does the liver do? It actually does a lot of things. You cannot live without a liver at all. Um, and although they're working on making an artificial pancreas, that is just not possible for the liver because it does so many things. So I'm going to list them all for you on this slide, and then we're going to talk more in depth about several of them. So first of all, the liver removes and metabolizes, right? So it processes toxins and waste products from our bloodstream, both from blood that's coming to it from the hepatic portal vein, as well as blood in our general circulation that's coming in through the uh, hepatic artery proper. It's also going to manage glucose reserves by storing extra glucose as glycogen, and then when we need it, breaking down that glycogen into glucose when needed. It's going to produce bile, uh, which is a solution made of several different things, including bile salts, which we make from cholesterol, and bilirubin, which is actually a breakdown product of old hemoglobin from red blood cells that have died and been broken apart. It's also going to produce urea from breakdown products of amino acids so that then we can excrete them with our kidneys. It's going to store iron and some fat soluble vitamins, which are vitamins A, D, E, and K. It helps to regulate cholesterol levels. 
and it also manufactures some really important plasma proteins. So you can see here some of these things are grayed out because I'm not going to expect you for 4, 5, and 6 to know the details of those, um, but we're going to talk more in depth about 1 through 3 and number 7 in this lecture. So first of all, right, you can think of your liver as kind of a sewage treatment plant, right? So it's going to remove wastes and toxins from the blood. So again, we have all this blood coming from the intestines, draining here's our inferior mesenteric vein, here's our superior mesenteric vein, up into the hepatic portal vein, which branches out into the liver, goes into capillaries, and then strangely, right, veins into capillaries, weird portal circulation, then that blood, once it's it's been processed and filtered is going to drain through hepatic veins into the inferior vena cava and back into the general circulation. So this is a really important job. So some of the toxins that our liver is going to process for us are acetaminophen, which is Tylenol, alcohol, right, and many other medications and substances that we routinely ingest. So this is that information in text in case you need to review. So we also talked about how it's going to do some glucose management. So this right here is an individual molecule of glucose. If you hook it up to a bunch of other glucoses in this kind of branching pattern, you make glycogen. So in the diagram over here on the right, it's like we've kind of zoomed out, so we're farther away. Each one of these little dots is a little individual glucose molecule, and you can see how we've kind of strung them together like beads on a chain, but with lots of different branches, and that is glycogen. So glycogen is the storage form of glucose in our body. So when glucose levels are very high in the hepatic portal vein, the liver is going to make it into glycogen and store it. So it's basically going to put it away in the pantry, right? This is more glucose than we need for right now. So we're going to take a whole bunch of it, package it as glycogen, stick it in the pantry for later. And then later, when you're not eating and there's not a lot of uh, glucose coming in through the portal vein, then you're going to go to the pantry, get out your glycogen, and break it apart and release glucose into the bloodstream. Super duper important function of the liver. Now the liver is also in a pinch. If the pantry is bare and there's no glycogen in it, the liver is also able the liver is also able to find other ingredients in the pantry and make glucose out of them. So the liver can also make glucose from fatty acids, from glycerol, and even from amino acids. So you'll use these if you're breaking down muscle or fat for energy, right? Because if you break down muscle, you get amino acids. If you break down fat, you get fatty acids. And so this process of making glucose out of other types of molecules is called gluco because you're making making glucose, neo for new, genesis for creation. So this is kind of a backup to our backup system. It works, but it's not very efficient. Um, a lot of energy ends up getting wasted if you're using fat, fatty acids, or amino acids to produce glucose. Um, and that's how some of those ketogenic diets, that's how they work. They take advantage of the fact that we're much less efficient at making glucose out of amino acids and fatty acids. All right, so this is why people carb load before a big athletic event, right? Especially an endurance event, event is because if you eat a whole bunch of carbohydrates, then you have a ton of glucose coming into the liver through the hepatic portal vein, and the liver will turn all of that extra glucose into glycogen and pack it into the pantry. So uh, a lot of people will have, you know, a spaghetti feed or a big pasta dinner, eat a lot of bread, a lot of carbohydrates before a big athletic event, uh, particularly in an endurance or long race type of event, um, so that they can have as much glycogen as possible. Because if you, when you run out of glycogen, that's what's called hitting the wall. And for most people who are running a marathon, for example, that tends to happen around mile 18 to 20. You exhaust all of your body's supplies of glycogen. 
And so now your liver is having to do gluconeogenesis, which is slower and less efficient. So all of a sudden it just feels like you're trying to run through molasses, right? Because it's really hard to produce enough glucose, release enough glucose into the bloodstream to fuel all that activity that is happening uh, in your muscles, right? So this is one of the reasons why sports drinks like Gatorade or Powerade or any of those things contain sugar in them right is to try to give you a little extra glucose to help you pass that wall right or like in the morning when you wake up <laughs> Usually, you've used up your glycogen stores um, unless you had a big carb-heavy meal the day before. Um, and so, if you're if you're too lazy to get out of bed, you need your liver to do some gluconeogenesis for you. All right. What else does the liver do? Okay, so it's also going to make bile, which is a yellowish green liquid that contains several different things, including bilirubin, which I mentioned is a breakdown product of old hemoglobin from dead red blood cells, and it's the dark greenish yellow color. This is why when you get a bruise, so a bruise is when blood leaks out into the tissues of your body, and then over time it gets that kind of greenish yellowish color. That's because those red blood cells that leaked out into your tissues have been broken down, and the hemoglobin has been broken down into bilirubin. So that's what's causing those colors of those bruises is that bilirubin. So the liver is going to use bilirubin to make bile, and that yellow-green color of bile is why our poop is brown. So if you don't have any bilirubin um, and your liver is not making any bile or the bile isn't able to get into your intestines, your stool will actually be kind of a clay colored, like kind of a beigeish grayish color. Uh, the reason why it's dark brown is because of the presence of bilirubin. Just a little interesting trivia. <laughs> so bile also contains bile salts, which you might remember are made from cholesterol. Now bile salts are really important to the chemical digestion of lipids because what they do is they emulsify fats. So you know already that fat and water right doesn't mix right so if you have a oil and vinegar salad dressing and you let it sit for a while the oil is going to float up to the top right so you might be like well i have a special balsamic vinegar salad dressing and it doesn't do that well if it doesn't do that what they've done is they've added an emulsifier to that salad dressing. And so emulsifiers break the fat into tiny, tiny globules and makes it easier for them to kind of disperse through that aqueous or water-based solution. This is really important for the digestion of lipids or fats to break them up into these little tiny, tiny globules so that we actually have enough surface area for our enzymes to do the chemical digestion. If it's one big blob of a fat globule, the enzyme can only get to the outside parts of the globule and we wouldn't be able to digest sufficiently. So bile is really important for lipid digestion. The bile that's produced by the liver is either going to be stored in the gallbladder for later or sent directly down the bile duct into the small intestine. The final thing I want to talk to you about the liver is the uh, plasma proteins that it makes. So two of the three plasma proteins that we talked about when we talked about blood are actually produced, manufactured in the liver. So albumin, which you remember is really important for its osmotic activity and keeping fluid inside blood vessels. So you will recall people with uh, protein malnutrition who aren't able to produce albumin can develop edema. Right, that movement of fluid out of the capillaries into the tissues because there isn't enough osmotic pressure inside the bloodstream to keep the fluid in. And then fibrinogen, which is that protein that then after when we uh, breach a blood vessel wall, the first thing that happens is the platelets are going to run in to form a platelet plug, right? These little platelets. And then fibrinogen is going to turn into fibrin and form this webby, right? These web-like strands to help bind that clot together. 
So you might remember that the third plasma protein that we talked about were the globulins or the antibodies, and those of course are produced by the immune cells. So the liver is super duper important, right? So it's gonna receive intestinal blood through the hepatic portal vein to filter it, removes toxins, it adjusts glucose up or down using glycogen as its storage form. Then the blood gets filtered back out through the hepatic vein into the inferior vena cava. The liver also produces bile and sends it to either the gallbladder or the small intestine. And bile is super duper important for the chemical digestion of lipids. And the liver also produces plasma proteins such as albumin and fibrinogen. So poor Larry, he had multiple insults to his liver. So not only did he go out and party and drink too much alcohol, but he was also just getting over mono. And mono is a viral infection that can also irritate and inflame your liver. And then he took a whole bunch of Tylenol or acetaminophen, which can cause damage to your liver as well. So this resulted in widespread inflammation and damage. And so his liver wasn't able to do its jobs, right? So if you can't metabolize toxins, you feel yucky. And if you can't regulate your glucose, you feel tired and wiped out and terrible. And if you're not able to take the bilirubin that's normally produced when red blood cells normally die and turn it into bile, then that bilirubin stays in your bloodstream and makes you yellow. If severe, hepatitis in the acute phase can be fatal, right? These are life-sustaining jobs that the liver does. And if it's chronic, it can also be fatal and it can develop scarring in the liver, which is called cirrhosis. So if you've heard of cirrhosis of the liver, that's due to chronic ongoing damage of the liver that causes scarring and decreased functioning. People with advanced cirrhosis may often look yellow, which we call jaundice they may develop that. They may also develop edema due to difficulty producing albumin, and they often develop trouble with blood clotting due to deficiencies in fibrinogen. Uh, so it's, it's, a real, it's the real deal. All right, so that's the liver. Let's talk about Gina. Gina is a friend of these guys, and she was totally fine until one night she ordered in from Ted's and she had pizza with pepperoni sausage and extra cheese on it. And then she developed terrible pain in her upper right abdomen. And she knows Larry, so she's like, oh no, could this be my liver? But her eyes aren't yellow. And strangely, she notices that her stool is now a light tan, almost gray color, which is really weird. She's never seen that before. It's very unusual and she calls her mom and her mom says oh I'll bet this is your gallbladder because the same thing happened to me and to your sister so the gallbladder what is it it's a small pouch underneath your liver that stores bile so remember bile is produced in the liver and then it comes down through these hepatic ducts and can be stored in the gallbladder for when you need it So the gallbladder just stores bile and holds it ready for when we eat a fatty meal, because remember the bile is going to emulsify fats, break them up into small droplets so we can have increased surface area for our enzymes to work on. When we eat a fatty meal, there's muscle in the wall of the gallbladder that squeezes. And so then the bile is gonna come, this nice dose of bile is gonna come out through the cystic duct into the common bile duct and then empty into the first part of the small intestine, which is the duodenum. You can also see in this image that the pancreatic duct with its enzymes empties into the same place, right? So this way you get a nice big dose of bile when you need it, right? Because you're constantly producing bile as long as your liver is working fine, but you're not constantly producing enough to digest fried cheese curds, you know, right in that moment. So you have to store it up so then you have a big dose of it when you need it. 
So the problem with Gina's gimpy gallbladder is that she formed some stones. Sometimes stones can form in the gallbladder when bile is sitting around, they can kind of precipitate out. This is often genetic, often tends to run in families. Hormones have influences too. If you have estrogen in your bloodstream, that increases your risk for gallstones. So gallstones are more common in female-bodied people. It can also sometimes be related to diet and medications. So what can happen if a stone forms here in your gallbladder is it can get stuck here at the beginning of the cystic duct, right there, in which case every time the gallbladder tries to contract and push bile out, it's gonna hit that blockage and it's gonna be really painful. Also, you're not gonna be able to get bile down into the intestines, right? So you notice with Gina, she had her stool was this really weird color that indicated that bile was not getting into her intestines at all, and she had pain. So she probably had a stone right here. Sometimes stones can get they can move down the pike a little bit and they can get stuck right down here where both the pancreatic duct and the common bile duct come together. And that can be even more dangerous because that not only prevents bile from getting into the intestines, but it also creates a blockage on the side of the pancreas. And so gallstones, if they block the pancreatic duct, can also be a cause of pancreatitis, right? So if the pancreas then gets inflamed because there's a blockage in its duct and it starts leaking its enzymes, well then you're really sick. So what do we do for gallstones? Well, we take their gallbladders out. <laughs> so sure, yes, we go in and we remove the gallstones from the tubes, right, uh, from the ducts. And sometimes they'll just do that. They'll kind of go in through an endoscope and just remove the gallstone. But in most people, if you've formed gallstones once, you'll form them again. And um, these can potentially be dangerous by causing a lot of inflammation in the gallbladder or the pancreas, as I mentioned. So uh, we don't want to take a chance. So for most people who have problems with repeated gallstones that make them sick, the treatment is to remove the gallbladder entirely. That way, if the bile isn't sitting around, there's no stones that can form. And you still have those hepatic ducts draining into the common bile duct. So bile that's produced by the liver can still get into the intestines. It's just a slow drip, 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 and you lose the ability to store up a bunch to get a big dose all at once. So can you live without your gallbladder? Yes, absolutely, you can. A lot of people do, right? But now think about what symptoms might you have? What might you not be able to do as well if you don't have a gallbladder versus if you do? So take a moment. Hopefully you've figured it out already. But, so you've lost your ability to store up a whole big dose of bile for when you want to eat a big fatty meal. So it tends to happen to people who no longer have a gallbladder is if they order out from Log Jam and they get fried cheese curds and a bacon double cheeseburger on a chocolate milkshake and they try to eat all of those things all at once, they are not going to be able to digest all of that lipid. Right? So they're not going to be able to emulsify it. If you can't emulsify it with your bile, then you can't, your lipase enzyme can't work on it. You can't digest it. And what happens to us most of the time when we can't digest something that we're eating is we develop abdominal cramps and diarrhea. So people without a gallbladder need to be careful to not eat a really fatty meal. So summary for this first half of lecture 31, right? So remember the liver removes and processes wastes and toxins from our bloodstream. We cannot live without our liver for that reason. It also regulates glucose via our glycogen stores. That's our way to put glucose away in the pantry and pull it back out when we need it. It produces two important plasma proteins, albumin for our osmotic pressure in the bloodstream and fibrinogen for clotting. It produces bile, which is crucial for lipid digestion. And it also does some other things such as regulating cholesterol, producing urea from amino acid breakdowns, and storing iron and some vitamins. And remember the gallbladder is just a storage pouch so that you can store up a big dose of 
file for when you need it. And then we'll pick up here by moving into 31B, we will talk about the intestines.